It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey everybody, it's the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Chick, and joining me for this week's episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey gang. And Les Webster. Hello all. Our traveling correspondent. There you go, that's right. How are y'all doing? Not as good as Not as good as Les. Yeah, I wonder why. Mr. So Paradise. what's been going? Yeah, all he's missing is the cheeseburger. Mm. <laughs> so what's been going on in your corner of the galaxy? Although we kind of know what's going on, less. But let's we, start. With I Mikey. We need, yeah, we need to make less like wait until last. Um, there you go. I actually this week has been incredibly boring. Um, I have had to play Mr. Domestic this this week. We had house guests this weekend, and then my son started his soccer league. Sunday, and so I have not done anything fun for a week now. <laughs> pity me, pity me. Okay. <laughs> and I believe we said we are going to make less go last, right? I think so, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, this week I had picked up a book from Tomorrow's Publishing called uh, The MLJ Companion, The Complete History of Archie Superheroes. And it's, uh, it's a book that chronicles what probably not a lot of people know is that Archie Comics, although when it original was co- originally was called MLJ Publications, they had their own line of superheroes that started, I guess, back in the 40s. And this chronicles all the early days up until now. And... It goes through all the different eras of when they were actually, there was a time where they were actually, the characters were licensed out to DC. Uh, Les probably remembers this. Uh, back in the 90s uh, under uh, the Impact imprint. And then DC turned around and, and tried to use them again. Oh, what was it about? 2008, 2009? Around there? So. Yeah. And then, and now, now they are trying to make a comeback under Archie Archie Comics uh, umbrella with the imprint Dark Circle, which is kind of a take of the original imprint called Red Circle. And you know they've come out with uh, a series Black Hood, Hangman, and the Shield. Uh, some of those we hadn't seen in a while. I was gonna say we might talk about those later when we get to the topic. <laughs> because yeah yeah that's true little tease for later on mm-hmm. but it's it it's been you know i hadn't really had a chance to get into it real far but one of the things that was cool is from the get-go there's about oh 20 some odd pages uh reprinted of of golden age stories Featuring the, the the characters and the, you know there was the shield, the fly, the, the web. I'm trying to remember some of the other characters, but so it's been kind of interesting. These were characters I've seen off and on over the years, but you know, kind of crowded out by other publishers with superheroes. You, you just didn't get to see them that often, so it's kind of a treat and kind of interesting to see their beginnings and, and up to today's world. Cool. A little, yep. bit, a little bit of history going on there. Mm-hmm. This all fun. Yeah. Too bad you didn't get a chance to look at it, Les, and I apologize. should have let you kind of take a sneak peek because I know you really wanted to. Well, that's okay. I will uh, check online, just take a look as to what they have just listed for the uh, solicitation of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Les, what's been going on in your world? Uh, I got nothing. 
Wow. Where are you, Les? I, I am uh, in Kauai, the North Island of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, it's nice here, mid-70s, sunshine, a lot of, uh, well, I say a lot of rain, but rain comes and hits for five minutes and then it's gone type situation. And, of course, with the trade winds, we don't have the heat that uh, Dallasites would have after a, a rain. It's it's nice. I'm having fun. Uh, it, there were trials and tribulations to get here, but I'm not going to go into that stuff. Just to let you know that I had to redo part of my computer to be able to make sure I was able to make this broadcast. Everything's good now, though, hopefully. We, we certainly will not question your dedication to the show. Nope. Oh, and, and on behalf of the entirety of North Texas, shut up! We're in, <laughs> we're, we're, we're in hell! It's been 100 degrees for the last two days. <laughs> and yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> Boy, does Les know how to pick a week to go on vacation or what? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. He's in the wrong line of work. He should be on the Weather Channel. Yeah, but some, some, something tells me he didn't have much control on when they were going. I think that was someone else. but That was an executive decision? Yes. Yeah, that was she who must be obeyed, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I know how that goes. Well, cool. Glad you were able to make it, and I'm glad you have a good time, and get back here now. <laughs> Su suffer with the rest of us, man. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go, go, gotcha. turn, go turn on the oven in your suite and your bungalow and stick your head in it, and you'll know what we feel like. <laughs> it's electric, but okay. Yeah, give it 10 minutes first, and same effect. It's all good. All righty. On that note, let's go ahead and get into this week's topic, which we kind of teased. This this has kind of been on our on our list for better part of a year, I guess, since the last time there was a really big news item regarding delays in certain particular titles. And delays are part of business. Things happen and and we know that. You know, whether story changes or or artists may have some personal issues or, or maybe some other things going on. I mean, we, we, we'll, we'll never know all the stories of what goes into it. But we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how it affects everybody. Uh, Mike, you kind of have a unique perspective. Why don't you go ahead and give us your thoughts first, and then we'll, Les and I will come in and, and bitch and moan. <laughs> all right. Yeah, my, my – I have – I have some experience that allows me to kind of sympathize with the business end of the, of the bargain. I used to work in advertising. And so, I mean, delays, there are, if, if, you, if you have any familiarity with the, the printing process at all, you can sort of see where delays can come from because there's any one of a million ways that something can get delayed. I mean, all the way from the beginning of the process, you've got obviously writers and artists who are given deadlines but sometimes sometimes things happen in the lives of writers and artists and uh, things don't happen deadlines don't get met and then usually the, the the nasty part about that whole process is that if something that early if there's a delay that early in the process that pressure gets pushed all the way through the chain and so you've got stress on your, you've got stress on your inkers, you've got stress on your colorists, you've got stress on your layout artists. And honestly, I'm going to throw in a little sidebar already. Layout artists are a group of people in the comics industry that don't get anywhere near enough credit because their job is tough. They have to fit everything into place. They have, they have to take all of the pieces of the puzzle and make them all fit within the panels and make everything ready for print and that is a an, an arduous process i have seen people do it and it is a pain and they work really hard and they should get more credit than they do 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's great to, to name the art, the writer and the artist and the inker and the penciler and the colorists and, and the letterers. And they all deserve their, their credit too, but layout artists don't get anywhere near enough credit. Um, Can I jump in there real quick? There's something else I definitely want to say real quick. You know, we, we kind of mentioned things happening in personal lives and all that. There is one, you know, something else that you know, things change. Mm -hmm. You know, stories, you know, they may have to change stories for whatever reason, and that, that could affect, that can seriously affect things. Right. You can have editing or, changes. You can have, I mean, the writer can come back and change things. The artist can decide, oh, no, wait, that's not good enough. I need to try it again. All the way down the line, really. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. So, go, I'm, so I apologize. Yeah, go no, ahead. It's fine. This is, this is this is meant to be a dialogue, remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so once the layout artist gets done, then it goes into essentially what generally in the term, in the business gets re gets referred to as pre press. So there's, I mean, the layout artist does a lot of that, and then somebody else usually goes through and cleans stuff up as far as they can and delivers and packages and puts together a. Uh, a print ready PDF and then it goes to the printer and the printer does whatever playing with it they have to do to do the same stuff basically that uh, there's that there's a lot of repetition in that part of the process and then things get printed and you have to have all of the equipment and materials available and ready in stock to do the printing and so you've got you've got printing presses or printers of whatever sort and you've got paper and ink and blah, 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 and you've got machines that staple the books together, and, you know, all the stuff you you see in the old movies, you see the newspaper thing that they show in the background, they'll do the spinning headline thing, and there's the printing press in the background, just running, running, running like a madman, that sort of thing, um, and then it goes in boxes and gets shipped, and let's be realistic a lot of what we see in the comics industry is not printed in this country. So there are sometimes horrendous delays that are just based on international customs and shipping issues, over, whether it's overseas or even just in Canada or Mexico. Sometimes things get held up at the border. And sometimes boats from China take a week longer to get there than they should for whatever reason. I mean, it's that long a delay is rare, but it happens. Assuming they can pay their fees to dock, right? And yeah, that's uh, and then I mentioned, and then of course those who may not understand what I'm talking about, there there's been a news item just within the last week or so about how many ships are just basically just parked offshore, the, the parked offshore because the company doesn't have the the, the money to pay the fees to dock and and unload. Their shipment in it's mainly games, but I know for part of it is uh, the latest Hero Clicks for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is part of it, but there's also board games and so yeah, that's that's obviously a delay too. So mm -hmm. oh yeah, and then so once they do get off the boat or wherever they came across, then they go to the distributor, um, which is a separate shipping process from the dock or. It's well, it's some sort of dock, whether it's an actual on the, the ocean type dock or a loading dock from the, the international carrier. It has to then ship again to the distributor, and then it piles in a warehouse, and then they pull it out of the warehouse, and they ship it to regional distribution centers, and then they have to ship stuff to the stores themselves, and then there are any number of issues, no pun intended, with just from that process, just from the point between basically the diamond regional distribution centers to the stores. I mean, that's that's its own level. That's a totally different level and its own level of complication. So it's, I mean, you could almost say it's amazing that anything ever gets where it's going to begin with just because there's so many moving parts. And I'm, that's honestly, that's a cursory over, that's me glancing over it here. That's, there's, I'm sure I missed steps in the process. I'm not. I'm not an expert. Honestly, I was an editor in the advertising industry. I didn't. I didn't work closely with any printers or anything like that. I didn't. 
I wasn't on that end of it. I was on the front end working with the graphic artists, the people who do the layouts and put things together. That was that was the that was the point of it I was at. But you had a you have a more unique perspective than obviously Wes and me and and the, the general public. Because all they are, all the you know, they may have some idea, but for the most part, it would be yeah. I was much... I was around it a bit. I mean, I, I definitely talked to those people all the time. So, because they were usually pushing me to hurry up, because that's how that industry works. But I mean, it's not that in that regard, it's not any different from the comics industry. Because yeah. there's de- deadlines, 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 man. Because they know, they have they've been doing this a long time. They know how many weeks out they have to have something in order to go through all of that huge process to get the book in the store by September 28th. I mean that sometimes stuff gets held up a week and people are all upset. But man, who knows where something got held up for that to have happened? I mean, there's there's almost no way to know who to blame. Not that blame is required or anything, but people like to blame things, you know. In the world of comics, though, you, you talk about deadlines, and yes, they do establish deadlines, but it's my understanding that the uh, titles that are done, the, they will pull the creative team in, and they will plan what's going to be done during a year, or if it's a special event, it will be done 18 months. The talking starts 18 months early. So everybody knows what is going to be expected, what direction uh, the characters are going to go. If it's decided that a certain character is going to die, it's already established. It's not all of a sudden, six weeks out, we're going to kill this guy. No, this was planned a year to a year and a half prior. Yeah, that dude, that dude that just got shot dead and got shot in the head in the book that you just read, that trigger was pulled 18 months ago. 18 months ago. Right. Now, I can understand uh, delays because in various series, in the past they have had a filler issue. They, they finish an arc. They have a guest writer, guest artist come in for one issue and then go back to the, the next arc. It's just a comic book that fills a month gap, and that's all they look at. And sometimes that happens with de- delay by a writer and or artist. And I'm when I say artist, I'm talking about the whole realm of which you spoke, everything from layout men to pencils to inks to colors mm-hmm. and that like, even uh, letters. Then that type of delay is not a big deal. The the fans are are not so off put by that. It's when a company has a big event going and they have to delay the end of the event for two months or a half year and in so doing they delay the release of new titles which are based on what happens in the big event. There's where the the stores suffer, and Thomas will tell you why that is. I will talk to you about the readers. The readers suffer because all of a sudden they're ready for this next thing, and they don't have anything to pick up. There is no new comic that has spawned off the big event. There's To me, that's a major problem. Thomas will tell you what the ramifications of that are. A delay like that for eight to six to eight months can cause such harm to a store, which is then passed down to the reader, which is then boomeranged back to the store. There's where I have the problem. You, you planned this event 18 months in advance. You've had writers and artists working on it. I know they do diligent work. They do great work. But why are you going to promote something and then say, oh, by the way, this promotion won't be coming out till the end of our big event, which has been delayed three to six to eight months? 
there's there's where the readers get real tired, and rightly so. Thomas, yeah, um, I, I'll speak to what you're what you're talking about regarding the stores, and it, and it kind of ties back to the, the readers as well. If when there's delays, people start losing interest in the story, whether it's an event or a main book or whatever, they start losing interest because there's like, well, you know, there's other things out there that have my attention. So all of a sudden, stores have copies of books that they were planning on were guaranteed sales because readers said, I want that book. And now they go, I don't want that book because it's not coming out on time or, or whatever. So the stores are stuck with extra copies that they were planning on on selling, and now they go, well, what do I do? Well, let me ask you this. If, if a store orders, say, 50 copies of book seven of an eight-issue run, and book seven is delayed for six weeks, does the store, do the stores get the opportunity to, to change their orders in that time? Well, well, what happens is we do initial order, like right now, that we're ordering stuff for November. Now, two months from now, there will be a what they call FOC, which is a final order cutoff, where we can go back and we can look at our numbers and we can adjust them, either add more copies or, or less more copies, but that's going to be a month out. So, yeah, if, say in this example, I'm ordering, I'll take your numbers, I'm ordering 50 copies of Chapter 7 of an 8-issue story arc for November. And then they come out and say late October or so, say, well, things have been delayed. More than likely, if it's been delayed, then that won't, if I'm, if I'm, I'm trying to remember, I don't, if it's been delayed, say, to January or so, I don't believe I, we would have to do our final order numbers then, but still... I mean, we can still make adjustments, but if there are some people at the last minute or after after that time that we cut off our numbers, come in and go, well, this is taking too long. I've lost interest. I just take that off my list. Yeah, then we're stuck with those. Right. So it is possible that these delays can happen in a way that screws with that FOC. Yeah. But I'm... I'm I, I, I think when it's delayed out, if it's if it's mentioned in time, then yes, there is a chance for retailers to be able to adjust if the readers come to us and say, you know what, never mind, thank you anyway. But after that cutoff, we're stuck with those numbers whether we can sell them or not. And, so I and, mean, and some publishers have like some sort of buyback program, right, on certain titles. Am I remembering that correctly? Some titles are offered to be returned for, for credit. Right, right. Yeah, so some publishers do, some publishers don't. Right, and I'm sure the publishers that do don't do it on every title also. So. No, there's it's certain titles, but there there's one publisher that I can think of that I don't remember ever seeing a title as a return. Now, I could be mistaken, but... But you it, haven't seen it. I don't. It doesn't, doesn't mean that right doesn't happen, but you haven't seen it. I'm, yeah, I'm not saying it never. I'm not saying it never happens. I just don't recall ever seeing it. Now, if I may, the idea of ordering 50 copies of issue number seven of an eight-issue series is great. What happens? And this is recent too. That that uh, eight issue series all all of a sudden becomes a nine issue series. How does a a reader react to that? Because most readers have a set amount of money that they can spend on uh, comic books, and all of a sudden they're going to be stretched one more month. And that doesn't mean that that ninth issue is going to come out on time. It could be delayed itself. And as a result, it may delay another comic from coming out because something major in the ninth issue of this one causes 
a ripple to other stuff. I don't like delays. No one likes delays. The publishers don't like delays. But this right. causes huge trouble. It does. But if in case where, like you say, that, that, that a book that was intended for a certain number of issues and all of a sudden it's expanded... What I do as someone who works in a store, if I have that information, I, I make sure that those readers who are buying that book on, okay, you do realize that this has been expanded for one more issue. I think that's the obligation for all stores. It, 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 that's part of our job is to make the readers aware of what's going on and as well as advise them on, on books as, hey, you like this book, you might want to check that out. That kind of thing. So and that's that's how I kind of look at it. Right, so. and it's for that very reason. It's for that if you're if you know if this is someone you know doesn't just doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of money, and they might not they, if it's if it's going to get pushed out one more month, they, they you, you want to know if they're going to cancel. If they're going to say no, I don't want issue nine. Screw them. They're just trying to take my money away from me. That way, I mean, you're 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 letting them know, and you're letting them be a part of their own buying process. And on top of that, right. you're also thinking about your own buying process because you need to know that you can drop one more issue off of your purchase for that for that issue right so it, it's it, um, you're helping it's helping both ways so it's definitely right. the way to go it's definitely the way to do it true but here here's me going back as a as a reader in this case if i'm walking in and i'm buying said issue number seven and then Mr. Retailer says, oh, by the way, I don't know if you know, but this has been extended to number to nine issues. Well, I'm already seven issues in. I mean, yeah, there may be issues with funds, but if I'm this far, it's only two more books, hopefully. Now, yeah, now if there's delays like we're talking about, where there's a couple month delay or something like that, then, yeah, I may... It, yeah, you don't that, want to, you don't want to get surprised by it when it shows up. That yeah. can that could be worse than than knowing about it and figuring out a way to budget for the extra five bucks or whatever, which does matter to some people, you know. Yeah. But yeah, and and as Les said, it can also affect whether they're going to start this next series that's going to go. That is mm -hmm. that it, that was scheduled to start in January, but now this issue nine of this eight issue arc is going to show up in January and I mean I don't in my efforts to budget that five dollars I may decide I need to drop the issue one of the new arc so I mean that's the kind of thing that both parties need yeah. to know exactly that's part of the decision process there now I know there was a time a long time ago and Les kind of alluded to it and, and correct me if I'm wrong Les there was like an inventory of just stories that where if something happens they just threw it in and then we're ready for the next and then the next issue would start over you know be that whatever that story was supposed to be in that issue like a filler type story yeah it's, it's just a fill in it's just a fill in issue but back in those days we didn't have the story arcs that we have now you know we didn't have a story arc that back back in those days there was not a five or six issue story arc. There's a lot more just one and done. It's just more one and done, maybe two issues at the most. Two if it was even more than two, it was probably a mini series. <laughs> That's the thing that kind of that kind of throws me off. I mean some of this can't be fixed because things happen. Right. It's just a complicated process. Yeah. Some creators are not as fast as others. They don't either write as fast. They don't uh, do their artwork as fast. As an example, DC had a maxi series. Their first maxi series back in the early 80s called Camelot 3000. I remember this. It was a 12 issue series. It started in 1982. The final issue was in 1985 Ouch. because there was like 18 month delay 
between issue 11 and 12. That's a lot of delay. That was a lot of delay. I stayed with it because I was already in for 11 issues. They had already had their penultimate come out. It's time to finalize this and see how it turns out. But 18 months was massive. And every couple of months, I was checking with the uh, comic shop owner and asked if there was any word about Camelot 3000. When it finished, she was excited because she knew that I wasn't going to ask the stupid question again. <laughs> yes, Les will shut up. Woohoo! <laughs> so, well, twice, so twice today I've been told to shut up. Thank you. No, I didn't, I didn't tell you to shut up. I just said she said she would no, say I, Les would shut up. <laughs> I, I know what you're saying. Uh, but and and I understand that creative process is rigorous. It is my, uh, time consuming and probably mind numbing. But as a consumer, it just doesn't sit well. I'm with Thomas. I'm with Mike. Delays happen, but you've got to put something into place that's going to hopefully keep everything on track. That's kind of what you are, Mike, as an editor. Try to lean on the people to get their stuff moving along because they do have a deadline. Right. If, and and that's their and that's a lot of what they do is they ride herd on the creatives and do their best to push them to get their stuff in by the deadlines. Um, yes. And then once once all of that stuff happens, because there's several deadlines at that stage, and it moves on into the printing process, there's somebody else who's supposed to ride herd on it and get the stuff to the point where it needs to be by the deadline there. And then somebody else picks it up when it comes to transportation, and then somebody else picks it up when it comes to distribution, and and then the stores themselves. So, yeah, it, it there's somebody whose job it is pretty much at every step along the way but again you put that many human hands on anything and something is bound to go wrong at some point you know true let me ask you this and i'm going to use the example that's kind of near and dear to us a couple of years ago it was announced by dark horse a Conan versus Groot miniseries. It's coming out. <laughs> then there was nothing for the longest time. But when it finally came out, all four issues came out. And I've never really heard official explanation. I assume there was delays. I, I seem to recall that that went on so long that a lot of people decided that it was a hoax. Yeah. I, I remember to getting to the point where I was just like, yeah, whatever. It's never going to happen. But but then all of a sudden there it is. All of a sudden there it is, and it, but it came out it came out on time. And it's a riot. I'm, yeah, it was. I just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, and I'm kind of this is kind of the way my mind's working, unfortunately, right now. I'm just wondering if they shouldn't sh should. The thinking be having some of the books in the can before they announce. I mean, that's not going to solve all the problems because there's there still could be something to happen down the road. But if you have two or three in the can where you know those can go off, and those are going to be fine, and we can instead of announce because we you, you've, we've mentioned how the process is. Because I mean, it takes time to write write the script. It takes time to to lay out and, and pencil and ink and all that. It, it takes time. But maybe scheduling more time to where there are some that are completed. Am I? Am I? Y'all see where I'm kind of going here? Well, and then the, the the trick here is that there's a couple of different answers. I think um, the first and most obvious 
is, which is honestly probably the single biggest trigger for, for us using this topic this week in the first place, which is Civil War II. That's something, I mean, with, with the big two, you've got very rigorous schedules for everything because they're hell-bent on putting out a book a month on all of their big titles. And so, they, yeah, they're planning crap. 12, 18, maybe even 24 months in advance, and they're working on shit for, that are way, I mean, months beforehand. And yeah, they're by the time something even gets to the point where they're starting to plug it, they've probably got some in the can already, just because they know better, because they know how long the printing process takes, and they know where their stuff's coming from, and they know how all of those distribution chains work. They also know their creators and how long it's going to take them to get stuff underway. Right. And sometimes they have to learn that by trial and error. Sometimes they'll hire a creator to do something who is fairly new. And so they don't necessarily have that working relationship. So they don't necessarily know that they're really slow on the back end. And But the next time, I mean, there, there will be delays on this one, but next time they'll know. They'll either not work with that person or they'll work with them further out and make sure they're getting their stuff in the can a few months ahead of time. So, I mean, it, again, it's, they've got people who kind of know how to do this job, but sometimes yeah. that you can still slip, you can still slip things past an expert. Um, right. <laughs> on something more like a creator owned type book, you're going to have a whole different set of circumstances because you're only looking at a four to six issue run sometimes anyway. Or even if it's longer, even if it's an ongoing, you're looking at four to six issue arcs. And so they're bundling those together. And those folks have, a, the creators have a little more control over that process. And so they can choose to take a couple of months off between arcs and start working. The writers start writing. As soon as they get issue six of that first arc out, they start working on issue one. They start writing and working with the artist on issue one of the second arc because, I mean, they have a better idea. They've been working with themselves for a lot longer than any of these editors have, so they have a better idea of their own limitations or stuff that goes on in their lives or whatever or other projects they're working on that can interfere. So it becomes a little bit of a different animal. But, right. I mean, generally, um, well, generally I think Image handles that pretty well, and yeah. so do most of the others. Well, since you went ahead and and, and mentioned, yeah, it, it, we are. This is basically was brought up because of, of the recent news regarding Civil War Two. Yeah, the, there was announced a delay due to the artist, which, whose name skips my mind right now, uh, having a birth in a family. And congratulations to him. Absolutely. Yeah, things. That's 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 totally understandable. I get that. The problem is, is the delay of this big event and what we assume will be other brand new books that will spin off of this event is it's happening a year after they've had the same situation with Secret Wars. There was a delay at the end of that, and that delayed some of the tie-ins to that event. It delayed... It delayed some of the new books spinning off of, the, of that. So this is two years in a row we've had this situation. And, yeah, things happen, but this just seems like it's kind of make you question things. You go, what, what is going on here? Right, and, and it makes it's going to make them think real hard about it, too, because they're hitting their, this is going to hit Marvel's bottom line. Because like you said, this is hitting several titles. This is pushing several titles out a month or two. Titles that they want to have in the stores making money and won't be. I mean, this and this is not a good time of year for that to happen. I mean, this is going to hit the holidays. And so yeah. they're going to be pushing books into next year. And it's going to hurt their bottom line for 2016. And so, yeah, they're going to they're gonna sit down and think real hard about this one. Figure out a way to... Maybe, like you said, can these things three months earlier than they have been, just to make absolutely damn sure that they get stuff in stores when they need to. You were going to say something, Wes? I apologize. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing you were, Thomas. They had already 
had this feeling because of Secret Wars 2, and you would hope that they had learned something from that delay, but it doesn't look like it. It looks like they're just going to try to forge ahead and hope for the best. It's, but that's not going to happen. They are going to lose readers. They're going to lose shop owners' interest. So I'm not sure how they would pull out of this nosedive. This secret or the uh, Civil War II stuff is trying to reestablish their Marvel Now comics, and they have been promoting those for two months now. Mm-hmm. And that's when you're going to delay their release, their first one, at least three months or maybe more. They're gonna they're shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. Hopefully now, they can right the ship, but I don't know when and or how. Now at at this at this point at this as we're recording, only thing that has been officially delayed is the event book. As far as we know, there's been no none none of the new titles have been delayed, but we're one would assume, especially since we we are figuring that some of these books are going to be dealing with the repercussions of this event. Some of this is going to have to be pushed back because they're not going to want the readers to know the ending of their book of the of their event two months or three months before the ending actually comes out. <laughs> they're going to and spoil their own stuff. Well, and it kind of it kind of happened with with Secret Wars uh, last year. Uh, they went ahead and let you know, Iron Man came out, and one of the spoilers of Secret Wars. Was was unveiled in in that book, so it just you know, yeah, you think they would learn, but what happens if it ha- if it happens again next year? Because you know, you know, we're gonna have a big event right around the summer with supposedly everything ending by the fall, so they can do whatever they want to do if they want to do a brand new rebranding again. Or just do a new, new, a, a bunch of series launches and that kind of thing. What if this happens again? What if this happens a third year in a row? To me, it looks like they should just take off next year. Don't do an event next year. I think people would react to it saying, okay, I saw what they did the last two events. I'm out. Right, and they could really, I mean, they could probably earn a lot of brownie points with the general public if they did just make an announcement and say, look, we've, we've, we've screwed up the last two events. Um, we're going to spend all the energy that we would spend on an event this summer, and we're going to see if we can friggin' fix this problem. We're going to spend some time actually addressing the issues and figuring out how to make this work. And... Make it so that we're not just jumping from at the from the end of one event into the beginning of another, because there's a lot of your problem right there. I mean, if you're running a full year event, then you're having to start on next year's event before you finish this year's event, and so you're really just complicating the process some more. So unless you're also... smart and do a six to eight month event, and then take a few months to build up and start that process over again, you're not really helping yourself. You're not, you're not learning anything if you're not doing something like that. And, and, and for the record, we're not, we're not trying to slam the publisher. I mean, these things happen, but I mean, it's, it's just a discussion of why this happens, what can be done about it. And, 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 and just the frustration on all sides. Right. I mean, they're frustrated too. Yeah, we just haven't had a ranty episode in a while, so we just decided to pull this out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they got to be upset that this is going on, too. They don't want this to happen. So, were you going to say something less? I'm, uh, I think I interrupted you there. No, I'm okay, thanks. Oh, okay. He's used to us interrupting him at this point, I think. We, mm, do, okay. we do it all the time. Sometimes I feel it's bad about it. It's another form of 
It's another form of telling me to shut up. <laughs> I'm wondering why publishers got away. Obviously, it's going to be DC and Marvel, but their events were done in annuals. Do you remember doing an annual and you, you buy you know four annuals and you get a story? And it all combines. Yet now it's let's make sure that we hit every title we have out there and make it part of the, the story. Marvel did that with Secret Wars 1. There was a, what was an eight issue main story? Oh, you're thinking about but, Secret Wars 2. No, Secret Wars, when it first came out. It was like eight issues, correct? Well, or the, original Secret, the original Secret Wars was 12, and what happened was at, at the end of the main books, the regular, the regular individual, individual issues, they went, they disappeared, and then the next issue they came back, and the books kept on going. But to find out what happened between those two issues, you had to read the Secret Wars. So it really didn't, you know, there really wasn't too much of a tie-in. It was, yeah, it was a crossover, but it wasn't necessarily a single continuous story all the way through each of those crossover books. Yeah. Now with with Secret Wars two, that's where they had okay, here you know, all of a sudden there's one issue where hey, Spider Man has to deal with Beyond. I mean, it just right in the middle of whatever story they're doing, all of a sudden he's gotta deal with that. He do deal with this creature. And that's kind of what's been going on ever since. Right, you know, because they you're, can make more you're, money that way. Yeah. They make it mandatory to go buy those crossover issues. But with the original Secret Wars, the main titles would have Secret War tie in up at the corner. And you uh, would buy the and we've discussed this before, you would buy that Secret War tie in. There would be one panel in that comic book having to do with the Secret War and you're going, Why did you want me to buy this. <laughs> you, you've explained one little item that I've already seen in the Secret War 12-issue series. Yet you want me, you want, gotta, gotta make sure that I get this issue. That, that's why I'm going back to why did we get away from doing annuals to tell our story and everything is, is good. As a result from uh, Secret Wars 2, they restarted, they rebooted, they gave a new number one to Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, who had gone for less than a year Yeah. before we brought her back as a number one for no apparent reason. <laughs> it wasn't just her. There was a couple of them. And, but, but, uh, that, but that one, to me, just stood out. You, you well, just squirrel, yeah, squirrel Girl, it happened with Spider-Gwen, too. There was two number ones within a, a within a calendar year. They're just... Clear. And they were in the... Yeah, they were not miniseries. They were ongoing series. Clearly a money grab. And that's the part that kind of bothers me about it all. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big two guy anyway, but it's gotten to where it's just... It's, I mean, since they can't get away with doing... 50 alternate covers anymore because people don't buy them. They're trying to find other ways to trick you into buying new shit. And, you know, I'd rather be sold a good story than be tricked into buying just whatever you feel like putting out. And this is pretty much why I don't bother with the big two that much anymore. It does get frustrating. Well, we've already said that everybody gets frustrated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, they're not putting out as as many titles and all that, but it seems like ever since they come back, Valiant's been able to do it. Has been able to do it, do an event, whether it's four thousand one, the Valiant, Armor Hunters, whatever, and there may be some a little tie into the main books, but not much. It's 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 the main book, and then maybe one shots 
there are that are tie-ins, and it seems they seem to be able. Well, I mean, it's almost as if they're going back to that annual format. Yeah, I mean, it, technically they're doing it as like a, a like a four or five issue arc for the main story for that, but yeah, it's I mean they're not for they're not doing the forced crossover with all of their titles. They're not making right. you buy Eternal Warrior Seven this month right. just to figure out just to know where the hell the story's going. Right. They're not making you buy XO Man War next month to, just to know where the story's going. Right. Because the story well, is then, in the five issue thing well, right there. Yeah, either in the main the main thing or whatever mini series or tie in or one shot tie ins. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're reading like you said, Eternal Warrior, you're not interested in reading four thousand one since that's the most recent event, it doesn't affect the book. Now there may be a four thousand one the Eternal Warrior one shot, mm -hmm. and you want to get that, then hey, you're fine, you know. Or if you're just wanting to get the four thousand one, like you said, but you're not wanting to get any of the particular one issue out of a middle of a ongoing series, so just so you can keep up with the the event, yeah. So right, yeah. and it, I mean, and to do it like a one shot like that is 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 really handy because you know it might spark somebody's interest into saying, hey, I mean, I've only been following Ray all this time, but this Eternal Warrior guy who's in this one shot with with this thing for the 4001 event, he's kind of cool. Maybe I'll check out his regular book. And that's what you want to do when yeah. you're trying to sell the books. You want to throw in enough crossovers to pique people's interest and not, not, it, not just to yeah. force them to buy more shit, you know? Right generate interest in those characters and right. go, hey, this might be someone I might... I, I kind of dig this guy. Right. Or this guy's kind of cool. Thing. I hadn't noticed... I hadn't really noticed his book before, but he's pretty cool. Let's check him out. Let me grab his next... the next issue of his regular series and see what see what it looks like. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what you want to happen. That's what Valiant yeah. seems to want to happen. Marvel and DC, uh, they, they seem to be more interested in selling books this month. We're gonna see how many more how many more books we can sell this month, and well, next the, month we'll worry about next month. The previous big event for DC was Convergence, and they shut down all their titles to do Convergence, which I think was like 24 titles, two issues each. It was forty. It was forty titles because it was t okay. yeah because it was it was ten titles a, a week. Well, you got forty titles, and uh, at two at two issues a piece. That was eighty books. Eighty issues, but you got a finite story with each one. Then they came back with their main titles, and things were adjusted to meet with convergence. There, if I recall, they did not suffer the delays that were prevalent with some other stuff going on. Well, and, and but the thing with convergence was that was essentially done to cover cover their move from New York to L.A. because so that was when they were they were moving all their offices to West Coast. So they were so, planning to have those in the can anyway. Which honestly, not a bad plan. If you can, if you can yep. afford to put eighty books in the can, eighty books worth of printed material, however many issues you're printing per issue per per book, if you can afford to do that all at once, great, more power to you. Um, I think the tendency yet, is going to be to try not to do that because that's a hell of an upfront investment. Yeah. And yet it was not the big top seller for those months. Convergence titles were not number one. But, I mean, that's preference. That's reader preference there. Right, and it's also a risk you're taking by doing something a little strange, like shutting down all of your main titles. That's, that's a gamble. I mean, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's an odd thing to do. And 
it might work, it might not, and maybe in this maybe in the case of convergence, it didn't work as well as they'd hoped. And that's that's a risk you take when you do that, when you do something different like that. Well, they're testing the waters now with their current event, and so far, it's been a home run for them. They've done very well with the rebirth stuff, and uh, yeah, there is a tie between the titles. There is a little niche of a story there that is parts of it are revealed as you go along, which I think is pretty cool. I don't know that I want to buy every issue <laughs> so I can get the full story because that gets that expensive. See, and that would be my concern with something like Convergence is that I mean, I, you're, you're telling me, I mean, I may only come in there and buy three or four books a week, and now you're telling me I have to buy twenty this week and next week and the week after that and the week after that just to be able to keep up with anything that's going on in the DC universe that's harsh and that may be part of why it didn't do all that great either because you're maybe forcing maybe you're maybe forcing people to not buy books because they're like well if I can't buy what I can afford which is six books this week then I'm not buying any because what's the point I'm not going to get the whole story anyway because I'm not buying all 20 books this week so again, a gamble, but oh yes, it's an interesting idea in theory, for sure. But there are downsides. Yeah. Alrighty, any final thoughts before we wrap things up and go? Well, that's about the best we can do and move on. <laughs> I think I'm we about, solved another one. I think I'm about shouted out on this one. <laughs> I think yeah. Alrighty, with that, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll do our weekly picks. And we're back, and it's time for our weekly picks, and leading off is Les. For my first choice, I'm taking from Scout Comics a title, Solar Man. And this is number two in the series, uh, written by Joseph Illich, and the uh, artist is N. Stephen Harris. This is a new take on a title that originally ran in Marvel Comics, creation by Stan Lee. In this one, uh, there, the character Ben Tucker has been affected by an alien virus, from the alien virus, he's gained powers, and as a result, there are those that are following him, trying to decipher all of this. The ones that are following him are the police, and they just kind of want the answers. You also have the a secret government agency that wants DNA to probably recreate it, and third, and maybe the most vicious of the group is an alien cyborg who wants blood. And I doubt seriously that he wants blood for DNA samples. I personally, I do not remember Solar Man from Marvel, but I do like the concept here. And hopefully it'll continue to do well. Awesome. Cool. Sounds like a fun one. Yep. My first choice is Exo Manowar number 50. Yay, number 50. Cool. And unfortunately, it, it is the last issue of the series. Aw. Well, you know he'll come back. Oh, sure. You know, you, you, they'll bring it back. Uh, written by Matt Kite. I always pronounce, mispronounce that. Philip Tan, Robert Venditti, and Judy Hauser with a boatload of artists working on this on this issue. Exo Man of War was the, the was the first issue series for the Valiant's comeback. So, man, five years already, which is cool. Five really good years. Five really good years, and so I hate to see this book come to an end, but we know it's going to come back in in some form or fashion. But it's been it's been a fun ride. It was really good comic originally too. It, it started very strong years ago, and I, I enjoyed it uh, when it first started. 
and it has kept up the, its uh, strength through this. Yeah, at some point I need to break down and read the original material. I know they've come back and, and collected it in omnibus form and in a couple other collections, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, yeah, it's cool that they're actually going back and it. I know they want to do that for all of them, but they're uh, for, from what I had read, they wanted to be kind of tentative about that. They want to make sure these titles kind of succeed on their own before going back and saying, hey, well, if you like this, this is where it all started from. And that's I think that's smart. That's the smart play. Yeah, totally. I think that's a real smart thing to do. So I know they've done that with the Quantum and Woody, the original material, because I've got that omnibus, and, man, that's a that's a trip. So <laughs> Yeah, Quantum and Woody's fun. Yeah, so... Yeah, I'm gonna have to break down and and get the uh, get the XO Man War and and some of the other stuff that they've they've uh, put out. So cool, Mikey. Alrighty, my first pick. I've got a Dark Horse book. Um, I'm going with Cryptocracy. This number four is coming out this week. Written by Van Jensen and art by Pete Woods. This is actually a really difficult book to describe. Um, there is a lot of really wild stuff going on in this book. Um, it is, it put simply, it's kind of an apocalyptic story, um, but it's not the world we're used to. There's, um, if you can imagine a lot of the really common conspiracy theory type stuff and just sort of swirled all into this quasi-Masonic mess of a world, that's pretty much what this is. I mean... And that doesn't do it any kind of justice at all. Um, but basically the world is is run from the shadows by a group of nine families. And they've had this prophecy for a long time of how basically they're going to be destroyed and the world's going to end. And that process starts at the end of issue one. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's getting really interesting. And like I said, if you, have, if you know anything about like diverse, some of the really wild common conspiracy things, there's some really cool tie-ins here that makes this really interesting to read and i mean not to say it's not interesting anyway but it's there's there's a lot of fun stuff here and the pro the premise there is be uh, believable and uh, nine families that control so much i think that's a great premise right there right which has its tie-ins to Illuminati conspiracies, basically. It's where a lot of and it's Van and it's Van Jensen too. And, it, and it's Van Jensen. Woohoo! Alrighty, Les. I'm coming back with Dirk Gently, the Salmon of Doubt, number one, from IDW. This one is written by. Uh, let's see if I can get this correct now. Uh, Arvind Ethan David. And art by Ilias Kyrias. I hope I got that right. Um, if you've been following the Dirk Gently books, they're fun. They're they're just that. Based on the Douglas Adams character, he is a holistic detective. And in this series, this is the third series that they've done. Gently is plagued by nightmares of his childhood, which he didn't have. He goes to talk to a former tutor at Cambridge who happens to be a time traveler also. This character is Professor Reg Cronotus. And from Cronotus, he discovers that Dirk can have more than one past. So it's going to be one of Mike's big problems, time travel, but it, it's going to be handled with a lot of humor, too. But it, but it balances yeah. out by being a Douglas Adams creation, so, you know, it's all good. Yeah. And, and they promote that there will be Adams characters as well as some of those that will be revealed in the new TV series from BBC. So I'm... I'm Hoping that this will do well too. Cool. 
I'm going to continue the IDW train with Star Trek Waypoint. It's a new bi-monthly anthology book. And for the first issue, it's uh, the writers are Donnie Cates and Sandra Lands. And Sandra is also one of the artists, along with Mac Chater. This, at least in at least in the in the original in in this first issue, they are covering the classic Star Trek classic series, and then a story from the Next Generation, which we haven't really had. I don't. I, I can't remember the last time there's been a Next Generation comic. It's been a while. The last thing I can think of was a crossover with Doctor Who. That's been that's been years. So, yeah, yeah that'd be cool to read these, uh, see some of these characters again. And of course, it's going to be the original. It's original Trek, so it'll be re- drawn by you know drawn, look a little bit more like Shatner and them. Which I don't have a problem with the new Trek. I think I've been on record with that, with with my reviews. Uh, Mike Johnson's been doing an awesome job with the other series, but it'll be cool to see Classic Trek, and this looks like it might be a pretty fun series, especially if it's going to be an anthology, and maybe they can expand it out to also include the other shows, which they probably will. Switch them out a little bit. I would recommend that. Yep. Mikey. That's a lovely idea. All right, so given all the crap I've given the big two, like ever, um, I'm going to shock the world and pick a Marvel book. But it's okay (laughs) because it's Star Wars. Um, So Star Wars number 23 is coming out. The main title, written by Jason Aaron and drawn by Jorge Molina. We are neck deep in an arc here, and the Rebels have done something absolutely insane they have stolen a star destroyer this is if you're not familiar this is all set um like pretty pretty close post new hope yeah so it's in kind of in the in the time between new hope and empire so luke's still not a jedi and han and leia are still flirting but not really a thing This issue looks like it's going to maybe develop a little bit of the Han and Leia relationship. We will see. It will be be a lot of fun. And maybe also we'll find out what exactly in the hell they plan on doing with the stolen Star Destroyer. They clearly have a plan, but it's not entirely clear who's running the show. So definitely worth checking out. So it wasn't really well thought out. Well, now we got this. What are we going to do? Uh, so, I thought you had. I thought you were wanting to do something. No, I, th- I think they have a plan. <laughs> they just haven't told us yet, sort of thing, you know. And they haven't really decided who's driving. It was a need but, to know basis, and we don't need we, to know. Yeah, right the now. audience didn't need to know yet. Okay. Well, that's and, and we're not supposed to confuse this with Joyride, right? Um, I'm gonna leave the jury out on that one. Maybe we are supposed to confuse this with Joyride. We'll see. We will have to see. It's, there's, it takes a few more crew to run a Star Destroyer than it does the sweet little ship that they have in Joyride. But we'll see how that goes. Awesome. Great picks Very all nice. around. Any honorable mentions this week? I will throw out an honorable mention if you don't mind. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, by the time this episode drops, the second edition of Make Mine Indie will be out in stores. Oh, definitely. Or online. No, it's, it's pretty much just yeah. online. Sorry. But yes, it will yeah, be yeah, online. MakeMineIndie.com. It, it is a sizable catalog of indie comics that you really should take a look at because they do put a whole bunch of really cool stuff in there. Yes. It, if what is being put out it kind of is not floating your boat, I definitely suggest checking this out because these publishers don't get the attention – that they should and we're doing we're doing we're doing what we can to shine a light and and make my indie is definitely doing that and props to them for doing that mm-hmm. it is huge and very so cool. it, i remember the first one that came out which was 
three months ago. I remember looking at that going, wow, there's a lot of good books in here that I need to check out. And this one's supposed to be, what, double? Yeah, it was like 300 pages or something. It's crazy. It, yeah, it's like double the size this month, so or this quarter. Oh, no, it's, so, only, it's only 180 pages. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I got confused, but... Which is still, I mean, I think it's still bigger than the last one. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. It, I mean, it may not be double, but it's certainly, yeah. it's certainly growing. But that, that's cool. That that means that indie publishers are taking advantage of it, of this, and and well as well as they should. So yep, yep, awesome, yep, yep. good stuff. Props to make my indie. Way to go, guys! Mm-hmm. Especially uh, Peter Smitty, who's the the leader of this and he's also the publisher of uh of Alterna Comics. Yep. So awesome. All right, cool. Any special mentions or anything before we start wrapping things I, up this week? I do have one. Okay. I'd like to give a shout out for DC cuz they are finally coming out with Wonder Woman, a celebration of 75 years. This yep, that, is going to be ahead. a hardcover, and it's going to be a fun collection with everything from Marston, the uh, creator, to Cliff Chang. And you'll have stories from each time period. You'll have one from the 30s. You'll have one from the 50s, 60s, and on up. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. Yep. I'm I'm excited seeing that. I, I, I enjoy getting those, those collections. I'm just surprised they hadn't. They didn't do one for. I guess they can't literally do one for everybody, but you know, I think they missed the opportunity with Hawkman to kind of tie it in with the Legends of Tomorrow, and and Aquaman's already 75. But uh, hey, you know, maybe something might happen. They might do something with Aquaman next year with the Justice League film, and who knows? Yeah. But cool, yep. I'm I'm excited to see that as well. So, anything else? Mikey, you got anything? No, nope, I think we're ready to roll here. Alrighty. First, well, let's go ahead and do our our shout outs. First off, to Manny the Murder for the awesome music for our podcast. Thank you guys for being so cool and and being so gracious to to sample your music. You guys rock. Please go check out their Facebook page. Uh, a link will be in our show notes, and you can always go to our website, www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Go to our podcast page, and there is a link there. And we also need to tip a, tip our hat to Potter and Family, hashtag Potter and Family, the network, the Twitter network of uh, podcasts, uh, thank you guys for always retweeting and 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 liking and sharing our links and, and spreading the words of the fellowship. Especially Jake and Tom, they they seem to really like us. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys, you're awesome. But um, seriously, guys, y'all really need to go out there and, and and check out. Just go to Twitter and do a search hashtag Potter and Family and there is a podcast for every any anything and everything, and I'm sure you will find something that would that would be would be awesome. Uh, definitely, definitely check it out. There's a lot of good people out there doing some pretty cool shows. Finally, shout out to you, dear listener. Thank you for the downloads. Thank you for listening to our podcast. It's much appreciated. Please spread the word of the fellowship. Tell a friend. Tell two friends. Or tell a friend and, and ask them to tell their friend <laughs> and their friends. And so on and so forth. Please. Also, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, we're always open. You can always go to our website, as I mentioned earlier, is www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can go to our About Us or Contact Us about us contact us page and there's a form there you can fill out or you can send us a message via email email at the fellowship of the geeks.net 
or you can contact us through social media. We are on Facebook, The Fellowship of Geeks. And as I previously mentioned, we are on Twitter, at Fellowship Geeks. Mikey has his own personal Twitter account, at Mikey Geek. And I have one as well, at Tom TC Geek. Yeah, holler at us and let us know if you've got any stories about delayed books that really ticked you off or if you're a creator, if you uh, have had delayed books that weren't your fault or whatever, something. Holler at us. Yeah, tell tell us about it. Tell us a story. Tell us a story. We, we like stories. All right. Anything else before we wrap things up? Um, Just to... If you get a chance, whatever your uh, podcast device of choice is, maybe if you're on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, one of those, we're on all of those. Um, If you get a chance, slap a rating on us. Um, Maybe if you get a little bit more spare time to spend, um, maybe throw in a review and see. Just let let everybody know what you think. Let 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 everybody know you love us. That's what we would prefer, but if if you'd rather be honest, that's fine too. Um, you know. Yes, uh, we would appreciate that greatly. Uh, thank you. I took, completely forgot about that, man. Anything else? Or are we good? I think we're good. Thanks, everybody. Thanks much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. It's much appreciated. We we love you guys. Until next time, you take care, read more comics, and support your local stores. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks. And on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time... 